China's president has been travelling through Europe. Xi Jinping's first visit to the region in five years has taken in France, Serbia and Hungary. So, what has Xi been trying to achieve and what's at stake for Europe? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, President Xi doesn't leave China very often. His European visit came against the backdrop of rising tensions between East and West. Can China and Europe really work together and bring about peace? The last time Xi Jinping set foot on European soil was before the COVID pandemic. It's fair to say a lot has changed. The Chinese president was welcomed in France with typical French glitz and glamour. Emmanuel Macron is courting the Chinese market for French food, aeronautics, and finance. Europe has a China problem because it imports more than it exports. This is the trade deficit between the two countries. It's closing, but is still big. Beyond the economy, the EU highlighted China's role in ending the fighting in Ukraine. We agree that Europe and China have a shared interest in peace and security. We count on China to use all its influence on Russia to end Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. In an unusual move, President Xi called for fighting to stop, at least temporarily. As a permanent member of the EU Security Council and a responsible country, China is ready to work with France to take the Paris Olympics as an opportunity to call for a global truce during the Paris Olympic Games. On the next leg of the trip, China signed a free trade deal with Serbia, which is not part of the European Union. President Xi said the two nations were true friends and good partners. His last stop in Hungary marked 75 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. As well as over a dozen agreements signed, China is also investing in a massive Belt and Road infrastructure project. Xi Jinping's whistle-stop tour was an easy welcome back into Europe. Europeans, though, are in a trickier spot. Moves toward China risk antagonizing the US. It's a delicate balancing act during interesting political times. Well, let's meet our guests. Joining us from Hong Kong is Andrew Leung. He is an independent strategist on China. In Durham, in the UK, is Gu Chen. He's assistant professor in global media and information law at Durham Law School. John Gong is Professor of Economics at the University of International Business and Economics. He joins us from the Chinese capital, Beijing. And I'm delighted to say here with me in the studio is Vicky Price. She's an international economist and former UK government advisor. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. I'll come to you first, Andrew. I'm curious about the list of countries on the itinerary for President Xi last week. We saw France, Serbia and Hungary. Just talk us through how important France is for China and its investments? Well, the, um, uh, the whole European Union, um, led by von der Leyen, um, is very anti-China, you know, towing the American line uh, of um, confronting uh, China um, uh, on everything. Uh, but then France is, um, has been adopting a more, relatively more independent stance uh, towards China. Um, not least is uh, France's uh, historic links with China, both culturally and, and also economically. Um, so I think that the, um, and also the two had a, a very, very good rapport. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, Macron's earlier visit uh, to be Beijing to to uh, to uh, to President Xi um, and the two hit off quite well. Um, so I think that um, uh, France has chosen um, to uh, act as um, um, a, a supporter for China uh, in 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 a way, not hundred percent of course, because there are uh, real concerns. Um, um, uh, between China and the European Union and other member states. Um, but relatively speaking, uh, a more balanced uh, support of China uh, in um, a balancing um, against the um, aggression uh, of the United States uh, on all fronts on China. And Ge, the other two countries on last week's itinerary, you've got Serbia and Hungary. They are the most pro-China countries in Europe. 
Right. I think Mr. Xi's visit to Europe this time can be interpreted as a sort of diplomatic gesture before, let's say, uh, some sort of bigger um, trade war or trade negotiations might break out uh, between the powerful blocs. So we noted that in recent years, Mr. Xi has also proposed a set of uh, global, nego- uh, global ni- initiatives, including um, those initiatives on uh, stability and economics and civilization. Uh, however, these ni- ni- uh, ni- initiatives are Although we noted they were, they were well received uh, in these countries like Serbia uh, or Hungary, uh, we know that uh, the other partners, the other uh, member states of the European Union uh, may not well buy these things. And primarily because uh, they incorporate certain fundamental conflicts in values that go beyond mere you know, uh, economic transactions. And we could see this well, before the pandemic broke out, uh, if we could s- still remember uh, the comprehensive agreement uh, in investment between the EU and China uh, was simply stopped uh, due to some uh, other political factors. So the, there might be some still some, some conflicts between um, the major powers in the European Union uh, and China. John, just give us your impression of how the trip was covered in the Chinese media. How do Chinese people view the relationship with Europe and what Xi was trying to achieve? Well, um, the national media in China definitely cast this visit in a very positive light. You know, there's extensive coverages um, of the uh, uh, President Xi's visit. I think, you know, if you ask me about the uh, the French perspective, you know, if you listen to uh, President Macron's speech, he literally spent three quarters of his speech talking about Ukraine. Ukraine and electric cars from China, these are the two things that that are on his agenda, I think. But uh, if you look at the President Xi's speech, um, you know, I think uh, he's talking more about bilateral relationships, uh, you know, cooperations, these 18 agreements that have been signed. Um, and, and, and also, I think more importantly, um, uh, you know, cultivating a relationship between the two permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, France being the only one in the European Union playing that role, how the two countries can coordinate their positions uh, and how can they um, uh, uh, you know, by develop bilateral uh, economic relationships. You know, as, as Macron has emphasized, a couple of uh, difficulties, uh, but I think there's a way out. Uh, I think uh, we can point to one very positive achievement. That is, that in that joint statement in itself, you know, it's a it's something of success in my view. And furthermore, I think the fact that both sides advocated in that statement for a truth. Uh, what's called the Olympic truce, is something to be, you know, really rolled about. Well, just how important is Europe to China economically? Let's take a look at total imports and exports. Well, the US had long been China's biggest trading partner. That changed during the Trump years when the former US president started penalising China over its economic policies. Since 2019, Europe and Southeast Asia have emerged as China's main trading partners. And over the last two years, Southeast Asia actually accelerated way past Europe. Vicky, I'm curious why Xi didn't go anywhere near Germany. Normally, world leaders come to Europe. Germany has for so long been the economic powerhouse of the continent, but the Chinese aren't interested. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're not interested because there have been visits the other way too, because Chancellor Scholz had gone to, to Beijing himself uh, a little while ago. So um, it's not as if Germany is not important. We know it is. Um, But it's quite interesting about the French situation because it is President Macron who has made a big deal out of wanting Europe to get together, act in in a single unit uh, in terms of whether it is in relation to Russia or whether it is in relation to China, but also their own relationship, European relationship with the US. Uh, And a stronger Europe, it's his belief, um, is really what, what we need and I think um, the, the EU Commission President van der Leyen had made that clear as well. So what I think was coming out of the meeting in France is, is this, this unity uh, and this intention to ensure that the interests of Europe overall uh, were at the forefront of whatever was being discussed. That included, of course, imports of 
electric vehicles. It was just mentioned. Uh, this has been an issue and it was discussed quite a lot in the Chinese press as well. Uh, but also any other areas. I mean, the Europeans have tightened up significantly in relation to intellectual property. They've tightened up in relation to ownership from state um, or state connected companies uh, from anywhere, not just from China. So that, of course, has meant that in a number of areas, one is looking a lot more at what um, that ownership structure might be. And also, of course, they have been considerably concerned about um, subsidies that are given to Chinese companies by the government, whether they are direct subsidies or whether they are through loans, which are relatively sort of easy to, to uh, meet the, the cost of it by Chinese companies that may not be available to others. And that, of course, creates unfair competition. I think that has been the focus recently in terms of you know, how Europe should react to this. And I, I have to add, not just, once again, not just in relation to China, but more generally, because of course the US itself is giving loads of subsidies to encourage companies to set up um, operations in the US, particularly in the area of green and, and you know, climate technology. So, so I think this is very much what has been the focus, but I don't think that Germany has been snubbed in any way. Just tell me, I noticed that China's total investments in Serbia and Hungary amounts to some 15 billion euros. Some countries in Europe would walk to Beijing to get that kind of investment, wouldn't they? As you said earlier, those countries have been reasonably sympathetic both to Russia and also to China. Uh, and of course, you know, the question is what, what happens with those investments in the future? Should there be an EU-wide concern about whether those investments should really be sustained for the future? Uh, particularly looking at you know, who, who owns the companies that are involved and, and is there any state interference. And there has been considerable concern, of course, in Europe in relation to cybersecurity. There have been a number of um, well, allegations that perhaps China has been involved in uh, penetrating various systems. We had a little bit of that here in the UK too. Again, there are allegations of that. Uh, so I think the, the, the entire um, area of of uh, concern and supervision of what actually happens in the area of investments from, from anyone on the outside, including China, and how it might be threatening the security of the EU is, is becoming quite an important issue. Andrew, I thought it was interesting that no sooner had President Xi left than Ursula von der Leyen was saying, reiterating that she wants to put tariffs on Chinese imports, cheap Chinese imports, if Europe pushes ahead with that, how do you think China will respond? Well, I think that um, in China's, uh, from China's perspective, uh, this whole rhetoric about excess capacity and subsidy um, is, is, is a bit of um, barking up the wrong tree. And because the China's competitiveness doesn't rest uh, on subsidies, uh, it is built on China's uh, highly integrated um, come uh, a full range of supply and value chains. And if you look at a car, an electric car, uh, all the components, all the parts and pieces, all the materials, um, and the whole process um, of making an electric car, high quality electric car, are all in China. Uh, and this highly efficient um, uh, production machine uh, that makes China's uh, product so competitive. Um, as for excess capacity, um, a, a Reuters report recently highlighted the um, capacity utilization uh, of um, the Europe, um, uh, of um, uh, United States uh, and also um, the EU and also China. And China's capacity utilization is very near uh, that capacity utilization of the United States and the European Union, only slightly less, but nothing. Uh, that justify this accusation of excess capacity. So I think excess capacity is a um, almost a fig leaf uh, to hide the uncompetitiveness uh, of um, the products, uh, of similar products um, made by the European Union. But on the other hand, uh, China um, is not entirely competitive on all products. That's why China is buying a lot uh, from uh, of air, uh, um, passenger planes, uh, Airbus, and buying also a lot of uh, passenger planes uh, from Boeing, uh, but that's the the law of of competitive advantage. Um, 
Now, as for, as far as subsidy is concerned, of course, um, uh, even European countries and the United States subsidize their, their, their industries. But as I said, I mean, that's not the reason uh, China's products are uh, have become so competitive. I want to bring John in on the issue of electric vehicles. John, it's no secret China is itching to get into the European market. How do you think this is going to play out? You've got the EU talking tough on Chinese imports and China ready to go with a lot of much better value vehicles, let's be honest. Well, uh, I will discuss the subsidies later on, but let me first start with uh, pointing to the fact that the entire European uh, automobile industry is totally lagging behind in terms of uh, moving towards electrification, especially uh, the two French companies, Renault and PSA, you know, the, the two brands, Peugeot and, and, and uh, Citroën. Um, you, you look at the Munich uh, Auto Show. I mean, look at the Beijing Auto Show. You look at the the cars being you know put on the exhibition by the European manufacturers and manufacturers from China. I think you look at the, uh, the extent of electrification. Look at the uh, development of uh, information system, entertainment systems, uh, autonomous driving, for example. I, I draw the conclusion that the European industry is totally lagging behind. As a matter of fact, uh, Volkswagen uh, is actually uh, cooperating with Chinese companies to manufacture electric cars in China and then export it back to Europe uh, for, for sales. So I think you know this is the background we're coming from. Uh, I really think that uh, the European Union policy uh, is more about protection of its own industry uh, as opposed to a really concern about state subsidies. Uh, and I think, you know, this is not going to succeed. It's going to, in the long run, it's going to hurt uh, the European auto industry. But back to the subsidy issue. It, it, this is a, a matter, I think, it's sort of falling into the gray area. Um, th th there's a uh, anti-dumping, anti-countervailing um, uh, uh, a treaty at WTO that basically says that uh, you know the subsidies pertaining only to the, for the export purpose uh, is something violating the WTO spirit. In the, in the process of developing new technologies, in the process of uh, uh, of cultivating the industry, a new industry. I mean, there's an industrial policy that's being adopted here in China as well as the European Union. Uh, everybody does that in America puts huge subsidies into this. Look at the example of Airbus. It has a over 10 year history of litigating against Boeing about this state subsidy issue. Who can actually deny that the European Union didn't provide any subsidies to the development of the Airbus airplanes? And that's exactly the same that's happening here in the automobile industry. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, I think the real question is about whether there's any subsidy associated with the production, uh, the manufacturing side, specifically tailored towards exports. And there's no evidence at all. I mean, look at the, the European cars, uh, the, the, the cars from China sold in Europe. They're actually more expensive than electric cars being sold here in China. So how can it be the case that, uh, you know, these exports are being subsidized? Uh, I noticed that uh, Hungary is going to be the first factory site for Chinese e-vehicles in the European Union. Guess there's no surprises there. Is this going to become a bit of an economic battleground, do you think, between the EU and China? The EV market, Chinese vehicles yeah, coming in. I just want go on this, John. Go, do you think this is a, a, a frontline issue coming up? Well, it, it certainly uh, uh, contributes to the, the trade between the EU and China uh, to a certain extent. But as I... Uh, it just noted that the, the next decade will probably witness uh, great changes in the ethics, in the ethics of global trade and international rule of law. And that means that any trade agreements would have to incorporate or accommodate certain, certain values. Uh, and, and that's going to be uh, playing a major role uh, also for the trade between European Union and China. Um, just today, uh, we saw a big news, which is to say that the United States uh, replaced China in the last year as the biggest partner of Germany's uh, international trade. And this probably means that many European powers are uh, just trying to you know, uh, shift the, the focus of uh, their trade and, and business um, from China uh, to certain other parts of the world. And and that is a, a, a very important factor that these countries would need to take into account uh, when they are engaging with uh, each other in the trade talks in future. Vicky, 
How difficult an issue is Russia and China's relationship with Putin for Europe going forward? Because a lot, there's a lot of concern behind the scenes at the EU that Xi and Putin are just simply too close. Well, yes, I think that it, there's been this issue about whether Russia continues to operate, you know, at quite high level in terms of its economy, helps by the fact that uh, the Chinese-Russian relationship has remained quite strong. In fact, if anything, probably strengthened. And loads of products that perhaps wouldn't have gone to Russia before from China now do because they're replacing what would have come from elsewhere. And also trade more generally flows to China, whether it is uh, in relation to energy or anything else. Uh, from Russia. So there is a relationship there uh, without any doubt, which, you know, the Europeans and the US are looking at it with, with a bit of concern. But of course, you, therefore, when you look at sanctions, let's say, against Russia, and the extension of those sanctions to cover also other countries that may be involved in that type of trade, then, then we see that China, you know, suddenly sort of becomes quite an important uh, country to look at as well. So, so there is that element. But I just want to just touch very, very quickly on this um, subsidy issue because I think it's really important. I think the argument from the US was not so much on the subsidy front, although the, the EU is taking the subsidy issue very seriously. It was more that because of the economic situation in China, there was a huge amount of encouragement to expand the manufacturing sector because the property sector wasn't doing well. The economy was slowing down, quite a lot of high unemployment. I'm sure your other guests know about these things a lot better than I do. Uh, but the concern in the US was that a lot was produced, and it, including EVs, and the market wasn't there in, in China. So they were therefore exported uh, at prices which perhaps were considerably lower than, than others. But when you look at the statistics, the interesting thing is Germany still exports a large amount of, of electric vehicles and cars to China as it is because they're of a different perhaps sort of quality or you know, higher for, for the richer in China possibly. So the trade has continued, has continued very strongly. So going back to your original question about why not German, Germany and China still have huge amount of trade between them, which is of course, you know, keeping both countries going, if you like, and the manufacturing sectors in them. Andrew, just looking ahead to the continued relationship between China and Europe, do you see it being mutually beneficial as symbiosis, if you like, or are there gonna be some bumps in the road if Europe starts blocking Chinese e-vehicles? I think that the um, relationship between China and the European Union um, is entering into a, a new chapter, as it were, because of the um, um, US um, uh, pushback against China on all fronts, uh, but also because um, uh, of the Trump factor, because the Europe, uh, to a large extent, is trying to hedge against the possibility of um, Donald Trump returning to the White House, and of course, from past experience, um, Trump wasn't too friendly towards uh, Europe and trying to uh, put a lot of pressure uh, on European businesses. So the um, uh, the visit uh, is welcomed by Europe in a sense of trying to uh, at least uh, take early steps to hedge against this possibility uh, of balancing a uh, relationship uh, with these two big uh, countries. Um, but I think that the um, um, uh, the war in Ukraine and and then the uh, the, the world economy as such um, is affecting the um, um, economic growth in Europe, uh, and it's putting a lot of pressure uh, on even the um, um, the people in 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 European countries. Uh, they are seeing that uh, huge sums are spent. Um, to aid uh, Ukraine uh, without the, um, the, the kind of end game in sight. Um, and it's going to be a long drawn out um, uh, proxy war. John, I read a newspaper report the other day about Xi's trip to Europe and they kind of only half jokingly described him as the king of the world. I mean, in terms of doing business, he really is the man, isn't he? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know China is the, is a manufacturing powerhouse, and uh, um, you know we like to uh, um, you know export things, but also we import a lot of things as well. You know, I, I do want to address Vicar's point that uh, you know China makes makes too many cars. This is a very mind-boggling argument, totally against the spirit of trade. I think in Chinese history, we've never had a one day complaining about European Union making too many airplanes, uh, too many Airbuses, Boeing making too many uh, Boeing seven. Uh, 730 
seven airplanes. Uh, we never complain about uh, uh, the French side making too many LV bags. We never complain China, French uh, side making too too many uh, cognac bottles. You know, so so I think every country has its own uh, comparative advantages, uh, and I think this is what trade is all about. That's what free trade is all about. So so I think um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a room for cooperation. Uh, you know, there are plenty of new products from France that uh, Chinese consumers like. Um, and uh, President Xi personally promised to uh, uh, President Macron that he will personally try to promote French agricultural products. Uh, he said he likes these cheese products, right? So, so I think, you know, this shows to the extent of uh, trade opportunities, economic cooperation between, between the two sides. <clears throat> John, and to all our panelists today, thank you. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see there, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching. <laughs>